Welcome back to the light bulb tutorial. This being part two, we are going to be finishing the image. So we're going to be going from this to this in this video. So uh, yeah, we'll be doing the materials for the light bulb, which is pretty easy. And then we'll be putting in the scene. I'll show you how to uh, make this filament glow. We'll do even a little bit of compositing at the end to make it like a little bit of a glare coming off the uh, off the bulb there. So um, yeah, essentially, yeah, creating all that stuff. Plus, if you stick right through it, you'll also learn how I almost died a couple of weeks ago. Um, so there's that. <laughs> all right. So um, we don't actually need the background image anymore. So I'm going to go ahead and delete that or just uncheck that box. Um, and now I suppose we want to start seeing how it actually looks, right? So let's go down here underneath object mode. Whoops, not that one. This one underneath viewport shading, switch to rendered. Okay. And yeah, just make sure that you can actually see the light bulb. And there we go. So this is what we got so far, which is because all the default objects now just have basically a clay material applied to it. So the first thing I'm going to do is with this top half of our bulb here selected, I'm going to add a new material. And then here underneath shader, I'm going to set this to glass, glass shader. And now hit shift Z to go back to it. And you can see that we can now see into the light bulb. So you can see it's starting to look like glass, but you might be wondering what on earth is going on here? We've got this weird black thing sort of seeping in there. And you'll notice as we move around, like look at the, the insides there, it sort of looks a little bit like, you know, when you look at a, a goldfish bowl, like with water in it, it looks like this bulb has got water in it. And there is a reason for that. And that is because it is treating this object like it is solid uh, glass which isn't correct. Obviously a light bulb is only, you know, like a millimeter thick of glass or something, but then the inside is hollow. But because we don't really, uh, there's not an exit side to our mesh here, it just goes right through. Um, it's treating it as if the entire thing is glass. So essentially what we need to do is we need to give our object some thickness. Um, now the old way of doing it used to be you had to actually go into edit mode and extrude inwards and then you've now got like a duplicate of the mesh which was really annoying and it was it was the worst. I tell you back in my day you kids you don't know how good you have it. But now all you need to do is go to the modifier stack and then add in right down here solidify. Solidify. And when you've done that, I think we actually did this in the donut tutorial, but anyways, yeah, solidify. It now gives it a little bit of thickness like that. And, um, you know, you could adjust it right there, but that actually looks pretty good to me. So now if you hit shift Z to go back to rendered view mode, you can see that it looks correct. So this is how it looked before. Okay. So look at the size of that filament, this, this bit in the middle here. And then when you turn it on, you can see it now actually looks like glass. It doesn't look like it's, you're looking through a fish bowl anymore. So that's good. Yay. All right. Now I want this, this uh, glass tubing here to have the same material. So with that selected, I'm going to hit shift and then select the uh, bulb on the outside, hit control L and then materials. Now you might be wondering, you know, do we have to have a solidify modify for this one as well? Well, not really because in the reference image, you might remember it, the glass bit in the middle there looked like it was solid glass. So there's no problem with that. Okay, cool. All right, now for the base down here, this little bayonet screwy thing. Actually, this should also have a solidify modify too, because it's a little bit of thickness. Like you want this bit at the edge there to actually look like an edge. Um, I will offset the thickness so it's not pointing in. It's now pointing out. There we go. And yeah, looks good. All right, so give it a material, new material. Now, because it is metal, here's a little tip. Whenever you're making a metal, um, you shouldn't use any diffuse, any of that in the material at all. It's just 100% solid gloss. So gloss is basically what you would normally think of as reflection, but it's, yeah, metal is 100% reflective. There is no, um, unless it's got dirt on other stuff on it or whatever, but it is, you know, um, there's no diffuse element to it. Anyway, I did a whole PBR tutorial on it, which you can watch if you wanted to you click that little button there. Um, but 
Anyways, so I'm just setting it to gloss and I'm gonna turn this uh, value down to about a 0.6 like that. Let's just see how this looks. Okay, um, I mean, we can adjust these later on. I'm just trying to, you know, put them in so that we can start to, you know, see how the bulb is gonna look. And I want that, that, and also these little wires inside. I want these to have the same material. So again, I'm gonna shift select the last one I wanna copy, hit control L, materials and I can give it a name even let's call it metal metal this one we'll call it glass great and then finally we have the filament inside so I'm going to give this a new material I'll call this filament and then I'll set this to emission now we won't actually like if we just go into shift z you'll see that it now looks like it's glowing doesn't look like it's emitting any light, but it is glowing. Um, so I want to actually put a plane underneath it so that we can actually see if the light is, you know, shining out of it or not. Um, so I'll add in a plane. Before I do that, uh, because we're going to start piecing together the scene now, um, I want to scale down this light bulb because right now the size of this light bulb is roughly mm, about as tall as a one or two story building <laughs> in, in its real world size. And the way you can tell what the real world size is, is if you go to the scene settings here and then underneath unit presets, if you set it to, oh, no, length, sorry, set it to metric right there. Now all your measurements will become, um, yeah, actual metric. You know, if you were American, you can go Imperial, you deal with feet, I don't know why, but, uh, you guys can still do that if you want. Um, I'm gonna use metric. Um, so now that I've done that, if you hit N on your keyboard, you go to the top here, you'll see that these are now actual uh, dimensions, like real life dimensions. And you can see that our light bulb here is 2.4 meters high. So that's, yeah, about, about a one story size building right there. So what I wanna do, select everything, and I'm gonna scale it right down, all right? Um, and you want to think, I mean, you could even Google it. I think I did at the time, but like how, how high, how tall is a standard light bulb? It's about 10, 11 centimeters like that. So there we go. Okay, cool. It's now around about the right size. And I'll just position this to about there. doesn't really matter. Now you might also be thinking, why did we bother doing that? It doesn't really matter. We haven't got anything else in the scene right now. Why not just make the whole scene really big? Well, it's because sometimes... There are some, like even if everything in your scene is extremely big, like um, the depth of field with the camera, like that can be off because like it'll, everything will look extremely depth of field or like no depth of field because it's dealing with a scene that's like hundreds of kilometers long or something like that. So it just helps to get into the habit of um, modeling to the correct scale and it just makes things easier. Okay, cool. Now that I've done that, let's go back to what I said, which is I wanted to put a plane underneath it so that I could see if light is actually shining out of the bulb onto it. Um, and I'll turn off the world, uh, I'll just make it completely black. And there we go, we got a very dim little light shining from inside of the bulb. So what I'll do is I'll select that object again. Let's go material and let's set this to 50, <coughs> excuse me, 50. All right. Now, what is going on? We can see that the light, I mean, it is it is brighter and it is getting out, but it's coming out in little spots. And you might be thinking like, why is like, I turn it up to 500 now, 5,000. Like, why is it not looking like real light should? And the reason for this is that right now, what it's doing is it's lighting from this filament, it's going through the glass, and then Blender is trying to calculate caustics. So if you don't know what caustics are, you know when you have like a glass of water on the on the table and you've got sunlight that hits it and it creates that sort of illuminated glowing pattern on the table next to it, like that kind of like, like a magnifying sort of look on it, that's called a caustic and that's how light refracts when it goes through certain objects. So it's trying to do that right now, even though, and, and by the way, Blender sucks at caustic, like cycles sucks at caustics, most rendering engines do, um, but it's still trying. You know, you gotta give it points for effort. The point being is we don't actually want that. We want it to treat this like it's not even here. Just pretend that the glass isn't there, just shine through it like, like it's not there. 
So a quick little way you can do that is if you select your bulb, select the bulb, and then in the object panel, underneath cycle settings, where it says ray visibility, you can turn off like how it's viewable to you. So you can make it so that like to the camera, we don't see it, to other things, we don't see it. But down here where it says shadow, just uncheck that and there you go. So it's now treating it like, like it's not there, like it's not casting a shadow, um, like no shadow will be cast from that bulb object, which means it's now basically ignoring it. So that's a little, you know, quick way there. I'll show you another way um, later on, but that's uh, one of the ways. Okay, great. Now for the actual filament itself, um, light isn't uh, exactly white. I mean, nowadays with LEDs, we can get pretty close to like real light, but we're going for an incandescent bulb. That's what this is here, the old fashioned ones, the ones that look really cool, but are really bad for the environment. Um, so they are generally a lot warmer of a color. Now you could, if you wanted to, you could change the color here like this. Oh, actually that's the bulb. Okay, don't do that select the filament, let's try that again. You could change the color here like this, you go through it, you can go, oh, I want it to be a little bit warmer, you know. But you never really know like how warm is it supposed to be, what sort of saturated value, like, cause you could make it look crazy warm to it looks like a neon sign or something stupid. So how do you know how saturated, how yellow, how orange, whatever? Well, as it just so happens, if we split this view here, go to the node editor, this is what we've just added here, the emission, same color, same strength. It's now just here in front of us. So we've got more on display here. There is a node in Blender called, hmm, where is it? It's called the black body, uh, black body node. Oh, there it is, okay. Underneath converter, black body. So if you click that, you can see it adds in this node, which has got a temperature on it right here, temperature. And if we connect this into the color of our emission node, it's now taking the temperature, the black body temperature of the, uh, of the lamp there. I was looking at some, uh, some game grums before I started this tutorial. Um, but if, if you're wondering what is a black, uh, let, me, let me just pull this up, Kelvin scale, pull this up here. This is what this, this temperature here is in relation to. So black body, I mean, I don't, I, the way I understand it, it's like if you heat a piece of metal at a certain, like as the temperature goes up, it changes color, I believe. Um, but basically this is how light sort of behaves in like, this is the real color. So like a real overcast sky is like 7,000 degrees. So if you set this to 7,000, you can see it becomes this sort of whitish bluish color, right? Well, down here, you can see it's got household light bulbs, early sunrise, tungsten light, candle light. It's around about these 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 sort of range. Um, so, I mean, you know, you can do more research. You can have a look into different things here. Um, but generally, my point is, is that um, the, the black body temperature, if we set this to, I mean, it's honestly up to your personal taste. Um, it's not exact, but I'm gonna go with 2,800 for the black body. And it's now the correct hue, it's the correct saturation. You don't have to worry about that because it's we're just deciding the temperature and then it's powering it through this with the strength that we give it. And so it's now, <clears throat> it's one last thing you have to worry about. Like there's so many things that we're trying to control in Blender. It's good to leave some things up to real life, which in this case is, yeah, the black body temperature. All right, let's move on. So. Now that the bulb is set up, we've got the one that's lit up. Um, obviously we're doing a sort of a, you know, the, the composition for this image is this one here, which is one bright bulb amongst the many dead ones or whatever, right? So, um, so we're gonna be duplicating this bulb a number of times, um, but before we get into, you know, duplicating, duplicating everything, I just wanna create one copy of this bulb which doesn't have the filament uh, turned on. So I'm just gonna hit Shift D, just create a duplicate of that. And then with this filament here selected, I'm going to delete that material and I'm just gonna use the metal material instead. So let's do that, set that like that. And then we have a look at this and you can see that it now looks identical except the filament is not lit up. And then with this one right here with the, um, 
So this one, because the light is shining through it, we had to turn off the, uh, the shadow there. But this one, I wanna make sure that the shadow is turned on. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about some other stuff later on. But for now, yeah, you can see that it looks, uh, it looks pretty good. Um, cool. All right, so it is time to, uh, to start setting up the actual, the layout of the scene. So positioning the camera, getting the basic objects laid out. So let's start by adding in a camera and let's just pull it back. Okay, so the camera's about there and I'm gonna hit the number pad zero to zoom into where it's looking at right now. And then I'll position the camera to wherever I think is good for this scene. So um, now the light bulbs are gonna be lying on their side. So what I'll do is I will rotate this bulb here. Actually, if, if you rotate it just like that, you can see that this little bayonet bit would stick right into the ground. So instead, I'll just rotate it first of all like that, and then I'll rotate it on its side. Uh-huh, clever, see? Don't have to worry about anything. Okay, great. So I want it so that it's just barely touching the ground just like that. You don't want there to be light that actually passes underneath it. And sometimes you wanna make sure that your subsurface at the right level, um, because otherwise it could have that effect. Okay, that's good. Uh, right. Okay, good. So that's one bulb lying on its side. Now I'm gonna do the same thing with the, uh, the main one here. So just rotate it like this, and then like this. Oh, actually, yeah. Yeah, okay, try that again. So rotate it like that. Gee, this is fiddly stuff, isn't it? One day the computer can figure all this out. Like, I want the bulb to look like it's lying on its side. And the AI will just go, meep, meep, meep. or maybe there won't even be an interface. You'll just put the, the brain nodes onto your noggin, and then it just reads what the, you're imagining, and then it builds the render. <laughs> And then we're all out of a job. The future, future. Okay, so this is our bulb that is lit up. Cool, oh, one thing I didn't do as well, I wanna make sure, see like, I don't wanna have to like group select everything one by one when I do this. I just wanna be able to select the bulb and then just move it like that. So with all these objects here selected, if you select the object you want to become the main, like the parent object at the end, when you hit control P, then select object, keep transform. Now I can select just that point there and all the other objects will follow it. Okay, just make sure I do the same thing with this one. Whoops, control P, keep transform. There we go, okay. So, um, compositionally speaking, um, because you do have to think about composition when you're laying out the scene. I want the bulb that's lit up to be at the, a rule of thirds, like so, so sort of two thirds this way and then sort of one down, so about there. Um, and in fact, if you've got the camera selected underneath composition guide, you can actually turn on rule of thirds so you can actually see where that point would be. Now, if you don't know why you would use rule of thirds or you wanna learn more about composition, I've got a whole tutorial on it, which you can watch right here, which talks all about the different types of composition you can check it out. Click the little eye in the top corner of the YouTube box. <laughs> yeah, they started using like, instead of annotations for YouTube, now they're trying to use cards. So you get this little eye that pops up in the top right corner. Anyway, all right, so there is my bulb right there. Okay, you can position it however you want. When you want it, if you want to just rotate it, uh, because now that we've got the correct positioning, you don't want to accidentally cut through it like that. So whenever you're rotating, you're just hitting R and then Z, and then that will just rotate it along. Yeah, like it's like it's spinning around where it is on, on the spot. Okay, cool. All right. So let's just see that. Okay, that's pretty good. So what I'll do now is I'll split the view so that I can see from the top view as well as from the camera view um, how the scene is shaping up. Okay, so I'll actually increase the size of our plane here as well. And now I'm going to start hitting Alt D. Alt D is very similar to Shift D, but Shift D will actually create like another copy of the object. So you're like, the renderer will have to calculate both objects data. 
Uh, Alt D is what you do when you want all the objects to share the same data. So you sort of save a little bit when you do some render time, when you do, when it comes to rendering. Okay, so what I'm doing now is just plastering the, uh, the ground here with some light bulbs. And since this is really repetitive, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tell you a story. It's a true story that happened to me. <laughs> um, yeah, just actually on New Year's Eve this year, last year, 2016. Um, yeah, I, uh, I decided I wanted to try to fast, right? Um, and so I was reading Tim Ferriss's book, um, Tools of Titans. And he was talking about how, you know, the, the biggest struggle of fasting comes because your body's entering ketosis. Uh, but you can speed that up if after you start fasting, you go for a really long walk, like a brisk walk for like four hours in the morning. So I started fasting. I, I had dinner the, the night before. I went to bed. I woke up, I didn't have breakfast, and then I went on a, a walk, like what was recommended in the book. So I'm like, and it was supposed to be a three-day fast. Um, that was my plan. And then, uh, so I went for a walk um, through the bush. And here's the thing, as the Australian sun is pretty hot. <laughs> and so it's summer. I had sunscreen on, I had a hat, and I had a bottle of water with me. And I would I'd go hiking through these uh, through this bushland, and um, I kept having to refill the bottle because I was so thirsty. I just kept drinking it and drinking it and drinking, um, to the point that after three 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 and a half hours of walking, I drank like five liters of water, which is quite a lot of water. Um, but I started feeling dizzy, um, and I thought like, oh no. Like, I hope this dizziness goes away, but I, I you know, I'm, I'm starting to feel a little bit woozy. Um, I, I made sure I was, you know, still drinking water because I didn't want to, you know, get heat exhaustion, but that's what I thought I had. So um, I came home and I, I, I just lay down because I thought, you know, once I lie, lie down, I'll start feeling okay. Um, so I lie down and um, still, like, the room is spinning. And so I went online and I Googled, like, um, heat stroke, heat exhaustion, symptoms, whatever. Um, and it was everything that I had. It was faintness. It was, you know, lightheadedness, feeling dizzy, you know, wanting to be sick, that kind of thing. So I called up like this nurse hotline, which is what we have in Australia. So if you've got like a question, instead of going to the hospital, you can just ring up this, this line. Um, and they're like, you need to go to the hospital now. And I'm like, oh my gosh. And I freaked out because I read that like if you have heat stroke that your brain is basically boiling itself. Um, it gets above like a, a degree or something like that and your brain just starts heating itself up. So I freaked out thinking that I was gonna get brain damage or something. So I went into the kitchen and I got like a bottle of water and I just poured it from the fridge like directly on my head. And I had like an ice brick stuck it to my head. I'm like, we're going to the car, we're like driving to the hospital. And we're like, um, we get in there and they're like, oh, what's wrong with you? And I'm like, I feel, I think I got heat stroke. I'm like, oh, all right, take a seat. <laughs> There's a waiting room. It's like everything slows down when you go to a, a you always imagine like in the, in the movies, they're going to be paramedics and what are you? Oh, get that man on a, on a IV drip, whatever. Like it's none of that. It's like, have a seat. Someone will be with you in the next hour and a half or something like that. But anyway, so I'm waiting. They, they do a blood test and then um, I'm just waiting and I'm just drinking, just drinking, drinking, drinking. Um, and then finally the doctor sees me in the corridor and he's like, right, stop that drinking. <laughs> We've discovered the problem. It's not heat stroke. It's not heat exhaustion. It's the opposite. You drank too much water. <laughs> so uh, as it turns out, you can drink too much water. And I had. And the symptoms are identical to heat exhaustion. And apparently it's very common. People think that they have a heat exhaustion. And the only way to know that you don't have heat exhaustion is if somebody was watching them and they knew that they had been drinking a lot of water. Um, and the solution is not to drink more water, it's to stop completely and have salt. So uh, yeah, basically, um, you're supposed to put salt in your water. So you have a little thing of water and you put salt in it. And normally I do, but I was in the bush and I didn't have salt, so I just kept drinking water. Um, but yeah, anyways, the doctors were all very, um, you know, dramatic. And they're like, listen, I want you to know that what you did 
was very, very dangerous. You could have died. I'm like, I died. They're like, yeah, you, you, you drink too much water. The, the sodium levels drop in your body and then your brain starts to swell. Um, then you get a seizure. You go, you get blackout. You know, you could be dead. Like people have actually died from hyponutremia. Um, so there you go, kids. If you're going on a long walk and you're drinking a lot of water, put some salt in it. All right, so there you go. So that's my uh, that's my my stupidity for the uh, for this video. You can all learn from my mistakes. And before you ask, yes, there is actually salt in this. <laughs> it actually makes the water taste good. You put a little bit of salt, a little bit of lemon. It actually, tastes really good. Um, okay, now I could just see from that that I didn't. You can't actually really see the bulbs in the background. So I'm going to move a couple of those forward like this. So you can see that it's really, I mean, there's nothing special about this arrangement. I'm just laying out a whole bunch of them, rotating them along the Z axes, you know. Um, but there you go. Oh, Z, good. All right, let's see this. Okay, so that looks pretty good. Um, the basic scene is laid out, the light bulb is lighting up, but you can see there's a lot of shadows going on here, um, and there's also a lot of noise. So let's address the shadows thing first. So you can see that the light here, as it's, as it's hitting the ground, it's passing through the glass and it's creating a really hard shadow. Now, if we did like what we did with uh, this one, the, the main bulb, if we turned off shadow, we would fix that problem, because now it wouldn't cast any shadow, but you can see that now it doesn't look right because you can't actually, your eye can't tell if it's actually resting on that surface. It doesn't know where it is in that space. So you need the shadow um, in order to, to see that it's actually touching the ground there. But we don't need that much of a shadow. It's not completely pitch black darkness. It should be a faint amount of, of shadow, but not too much. So how do we do that? Well, as it turns out, we can uh, do some fancy stuff in the node editor. So with that bulb there selected, I'm gonna go to the node editor. And this is, this one right here. Um, this is the material for all of these glass bulbs here. And in fact, it's the exact same material for the main bulb here. So what I'm gonna do just for this main bulb, I'm gonna click the little, um, the number next to the name to make it a separate material. And I'll just call this glass main just so that we can because it's got a light that's shining through it so it's a little bit different to the others but all the others will now share this node setup so what i want to do you can see that it's, it's very basic right now it's just glass you know going straight into the material output that's all it is what i want to do is i want to add in a mix shader right here combine it with a transparent shader like so and if, if you were to just render this like this, what you'd find is that the glass now looks like it's semi-see-through, like it's glass, but it's now starting to go a little bit see-through, right? Um, if I went like that, you can see it, it looks like a bubble now, actually. In fact, that's probably a great way to make a bubble. <laughs> you make transparent glass. Um, but what I wanna do, you can see that, it, that now that I'm using that transparency, you can see that I'm getting the right sort of shadow effect on the floor there. But I only want this transparency effect to show up in the shadow, not the actual glass bulb. So as it turns out, there is a node that allows you to do this specific thing. And it's called the light path node. <clears throat> so if we add this, you've got a whole bunch of different stuff here and it does look very complicated. Basically, this allows you to control the, the rendering engine and tell it that if it is, for example, the camera ray, I want to see this transparent thing down here. If I made this red, you would actually see what that, that there looks like. So it's now everywhere else in the scene, it's rendering it like it should, but to the camera, I'm just gonna view it as a red transparency. Right, very odd. But there's a bunch of different ones here and you know, people have made really complex looking materials with some of this stuff. All I want is I wanna take this is shadow ray and I'll drag that into the bottom there. So what this is doing is it's saying is shadow ray, use the bottom input, this one down here. Okay, so you can see because this is transparent red, you can see now all the shadows have become red. So this is actually a, a, a 
quick way. Um, if you wanted to make a shadow that was a different color to the object, then this would be how you would actually do it. It's a method they used in Tangled. Um, Disney's Tangled, I believe they, um, I remember reading about it. They used shadows that were a complementary color to the object, I think it was. So they kind of cheated and they made the shadows a different, yeah. Anyway, you could do that if you wanted to. But all I want to do is no color. So I'm setting the saturation to zero like that. Um, and then what I want to do is uh, if this was set all the way to black, you can see that we've now got the solid shadows there. Now I get to choose how thick I make those shadows, like how dark those shadows become. So if I just make it almost white, if I go all the way white, it's now 100% transparent. Okay, so I'm just gonna give it just a little bit of shadow, just like that. Actually, maybe that's even too much. A Little bit higher, a little bit higher. Maybe too far, one back. Okay, that looks pretty good. All right, the other thing, just turn on this so it doesn't take too long to render. The other thing, so now we've solved the shadow problem. The second problem I mentioned was the noise. So you can see if we zoom in, you've got these little speckly dots, these little dots that are appearing on the screen. And if you rendered it for a, a longer time, you would clear up some of it, but you would still see these dots. <clears throat> now these dots actually have a name. Um, they're called fireflies. Um, and most rendering engines have them, but most rendering engines are getting better at it. Um, and they're finding, you know, new algorithms to get rid of that, that kind of stuff. Um, but in our case, we've still got them. And the reason for that is that by default, Blender tries to render the caustics. Okay, we mentioned caustics before. Reflective and refractive caustic. Refractive is the uh, caustics caused by light going through an object. Reflective is like, you know, the light, if you shone some light uh on a shiny wall it would bounce off you know that that kind of thing so i want to turn both of those off and now you can see and i think that was those fireflies came from the fact that um yeah i think it was trying to yeah trying to calculate caustics through these bulbs here i think that's what it was trying to do so anyways now that we've done that you can see that all those fireflies have now cleared up and it does look a lot nicer. And there you go. Um, so we've pretty well come to the end. Um, actually, well, we, we're going to do some compositing and a few other things. But what I'll do is I'll just polish up a couple of things here before we do, you know, any sort of render. Um, so you can see the base of this uh, bulb here. It's It looks like it's just the solid metal. And it looks a little bit funny. So what I'm going to do, because it's supposed to be that plastic, um, uh, what is it, the bulb? Yeah, it's like this black plastic bit on the bottom. So I'm just gonna very quickly do that. Um, uh, yeah. Okay, so, uh, eh, eh. okay, let's do that. <laughs> I was gonna, all right, I'll, I'll explain to you in a second. But okay, to make a shiny black plastic, I'm just gonna add a mix shader here, combine a diffuse shader with a glossy shader, which is, you know, 90% of most materials use this. Um, and then I'll just set this diffuse color to be black and then this so that it is primarily, actually I think that's correct. Oh, and you also need to make sure that you apply this material, otherwise you won't even see it. Oh, but I can see it there. Okay, that's fine then. Okay, I'm just tweaking it a little bit, making a little bit sharper reflection, good. And then you wanna select the part of the mesh that you wanna have that material and then hit assign. And you can't see it in the viewport, but if you were to change the viewport color of that material, you can see that it's now on the correct uh, part of the mesh. Um, now, we have got, we would have to do that for all of these light bulb objects one by one. But um, all of these ones are actually sharing the same, um, the, the same object data. So if I actually just, I don't know, move that there for some odd reason. You can see that they now all have that effect um, mirrored across it. And that's what happens when you use Alt D. You can see that if you go to the object panel here, um, you've got 29, the number 29 next to the object, because it means it's being shared across 29 objects, that object data. But when we duplicated the light here and this one, I use Shift D. 
So a very quick way is if I select this and then that, I can hit Control L and then Object Data. And now it's copied that um, across there. Uh, unfortunately, I need to do that for all of these, which is pretty boring. You know, it's not too much of a struggle, I suppose. But it is what it is. Ah, dear. What can I talk about? What can I talk about? Um, um, hey, I watched La La Land the other day. That's a pretty good movie. I honestly thought that was going to be a chick flick and that I would not enjoy it one bit. But turns out it's a really solid movie. It's actually one of the best movies I've seen in probably the last 12 months or so. It's really, really good. My wife was like, oh, you want to go see the La La Land? And I'm like, yeah, let's go check it out, yeah. I knew it had good reviews, but I thought, you know, that's the sort of movie that I will rent. I will not pay money to go and see it. But evidently, we went and saw it, and geez, really, really solid movie. So there you go, filling in more time with idle chit-chat. Okay, didn't make very much of a difference. You can barely see it anyway. Cool. Wasting time. Uh, the other thing I want to do is just for this bulb here, because it looks a little bit naked if you can see right into the bulb on the filament. I just want it to look like this particular bulb here is a little bit frosted. Even if the other bulbs aren't frosted, um, if it's just this one, you won't really tell as a viewer that that one is, is the odd one out. I mean, if anything, it's supposed to be the odd one out anyway, right? <clears throat> so because it's got a different glass material, what I can do is I can just increase this roughness here to something like that. And there you go. You can see that now it has, yeah, it has a little bit more of a, a glowing sort of effect to it. And we're gonna add a glow in the compositor soon in a second. But now that it's actually on that, it looks pretty cool. Um, and another little tweak I'll do, because you can see like from the view of the camera, the filament isn't that clearly visible. So what I'll do is right here, let me just, oh, come on, B, select that, select that. Oh, I could have just, oh yeah, I could have just selected that, couldn't I? That's very smart, Andrew. And what I'm gonna do, I just have to rotate on this specific angle. There we go, rotate. Actually, I wonder if I could have done it like this. Rotate local. Oh yeah, I could have, okay. Yeah, there you go. That saves me that time. <laughs> All right, so I just wanna get it so that I can see the filament a little bit clearer, which I can. Cool, I'm gonna give it a render now, just with the default sample size of 128, and let's see how that looks. All right, there we go. Rendered in 60 seconds, not bad. Um, so there's a couple of things that you know you might wanna tweak. For one, you wanna make sure that your light is um, the filament, because this filament is providing the lighting for the entire scene. So you might wanna increase it, you might wanna leave it as is. I don't know what you guys are up to. Um, <laughs> Maybe you want to leave it as is. Maybe you want to make it brighter. I don't know. Um, but I might just increase mine. I've got mine up to 8,000. By the way, this amount here might be different for you because it's it's directly correlated with the size of like the width of this little uh, filament there. So if this, this filament here was thinner, for example, it would be, there would be less light. So don't copy my exact value here. You want to tweak it to your own taste. Um, because yeah, otherwise you'll just copy 8,000 and maybe some of yours will be really way over bright. Some of yours will be really too, not enough, you know, so just go based on how it actually looks on your screen. So something like that looks, looks all right. Cool. So I'd obviously do a lot more, uh, samples for my final render. Um, but before we do the final render, I want to talk about, um, the compositing. So for this actual light here, I want it to, to physically glow. Like it looks like it's glowing a little bit because it's got the frosted glass there, but that's a little, that's neither here nor there. Um, I want it to glow sort of like outside it. So the way you do that is, you know, we'll do it in the compositor over here. Um, but the, uh, the compositor needs to know where that filament actually is. And currently there would be no way for it to actually tell where that exact filament is. So what we want to do is we want to move this filament to a separate render layer. So these layers here, these are normal layers, okay? Like a standard layer, like, you know, Photoshop, other stuff like that. So if I wanted to move this filament to a, another layer, I could do that, okay? 
Um, so that's now on a different physical layer, okay? But render layers are different. If you go to the render layer panel, this one right here, you can see that there's the default render layer there, um, but you can add another render layer underneath it. So I could call this one underneath it, I could call it filament. And because I know that the filament is just on layer two um, and nothing else is, I could create just for this filament layer here, show that just for this layer, I only want to render layer two, nothing else but layer two. Um, and you can see that the, the top render layer renders, uh, we're just looking at just this layer section here, not the scene, not the exclude, not the mask. That's, you know, more advanced. We're just looking at the filament, which is that one there. So I'm just clicking that and the render layer can have all of it. Okay. So now that I've done that, um, oh, and there's one other thing before we do the final render as well. Uh, I want to give it some depth of field. So I want to make it look like the objects that are closer to the camera are sort of a little bit more out of focus, a little bit fuzzy. And then that filament there, because obviously that's the, the focal element of the image is razor sharp focus. So I believe, do we name that filament? No, we didn't. Let's name the filament. Let's call it filament. I don't think I should say that filament, filament. It sounds weirder. Every time you say it, it gets weirder. So with the camera selected, underneath depth of field in the camera settings, click the focus box and just type in filament and there it is. And then now that you've done that, you won't notice any difference until you change the aperture. So if I change the f-stop, if I set it to f-stop, which is if you use a camera, you'll be more familiar with it like I am, um, then you can set the f-stop. So like eight would be you know a little bit sharper, 5.6 is a good sort of medium one, but I don't know. Yeah, six maybe. Yeah, that's pretty good. So I think I'll leave it at six. Okay, cool. So I'll do another render now. Um, and now that we have set up our render layers, we'll now have the filament on a separate layer. So we'll be able to do the, uh, um, yeah, some extra glowing when we get to the compositor. So I'll give it, yeah, let's go. Mm -hmm. 500 samples. Okay, and let's see, ah, let's go 1000. So it looks somewhat respectable at the end. All right, let's see how we go. And we're done, good. So we cleaned out most of the noise. Um, you can see that the floor looks pretty blown out on the bottom there. I'll mention that at the end, um, but it should look pretty good. So now what I'm gonna do is jump over to the compositor like that. Um, and enable use nodes, first of all. And I don't know why it has the 3D view for the composite, you don't need it. And I'll just drag this down here, since that has to be displayed if you wanna save <laughs> the edits that you do in the compositor. But other than that, we're all good. Okay, so the compositor nodes handle very much the same way as the materials. You've got, you know, you're starting, well, actually, maybe that is a little bit different, but the render layer here is what you, you get from the render layer, and then you've got the composite, which will be the final image. So you can add between the render layer and the composite, you could add, for example, a color balance node, okay? If you wanna see this, by the way, whilst it's sitting here, um, well, first of all, you could enable the render result down there, um, or you can hit Control Shift, and that will enable a viewer node, and then when you click backdrop, it's now showing it in the background there. And if you wanna move the background, if you hold down Alt and then middle mouse, you can now move it like that. Again, make sure you get the keyboard shortcut PDF in the description below. Um, okay, cool. So yeah, so if I wanted to you know, change the color, for example, I could do that here. I could make you know, one of these wheels. These wheels here, by the way, the left wheel is the darks, the middle wheel is the midtones, and then the uh, right wheel is the highlights. So if I wanna make the highlights red, I would do that and make the middle tones blue. You know, I could do something like that. I'm just using this as an example of, you know, between render layer and composite, what you could put in there. But the main thing I wanna do is add a glow to our um, thingamajig bulb, right? So uh, a glow is, um, is something which must be done in the compositor because everything sort of in the render scene is sort of like, you know, real life, like real things that you could, you could touch. But when you get 
Uh, when you start talking about glare and glow and things like that, that's a camera effect or like effect that you have with your eye or something like that. So that is something which is done as a post-processing step, which is why we're doing it now in the compositor. So we added, we got a second render layer here, which means that with our render layer here, you should be able to, if you duplicate this render layer, and then in the duplicate there, if you select instead of render layer filament, and then if I control shift left click on that, you should see a completely black uh, image with just a small white patch where that filament is actually rendering. So if you see that, congratulations. Uh, if you don't see that, uh, just make sure that your actual render layer, you know, the, the one with the filament on it, actually is, um, it is actually on that layer that you have selected. Okay, in this case it was layer two, and you can see that it is there all by itself. So provided you've done that correct, you should see it. Okay, so now that I've done that, what I wanna do is I wanna add a glare glowy effect to this little thing. So the way I do that is by going to filter, so shift A to bring up this list here, then filter, and then click defocus. Oh wait, sorry, not defocus, <laughs> sorry. Uh, glare, glare was the one I was looking for. So add this in here, in between the, uh, well yeah, just shift, control shift, click on it, and you can see we've got the glare there. Um, so this glare node actually gives you uh, a number of different types of glare that you can add. Um, simple star, I don't think I've really ever used. I am only just use the streaks and the fog glow. So fog glow is just a basic blur sort of glow, so that's, that's a nice one to start with, so I'll just go with that. Um, and what I'll do, I'll keep the color balance node, but I'll use it right at the end. Just for now, what I, ooh, yeah, I don't know, there's just a race car that just drove past, sounded like a child screaming, that was weird. Uh, anyway, um, so to, I, I wanna add this to our render layer up here. So the way I'm gonna do this is by going to color, mix, and drop it in here. And what this enables you to do, if I drag this and put this in the bottom input, okay. Now this, this mix value here, like these values, if you click the drop down, are the same values that you see in Photoshop. So if you're familiar with Photoshop, you know how blending modes work. If you wanna um, take the white parts out of an image and leave behind the black, then for that you need screen. Um, or <laughs> if you see that, then you wanna go add. Okay, so you can see that we've now got the original one underneath it, but we've just taken just the white parts or the light parts of this image and we're adding it over the top. Um, now you can see it's way too much at the moment. I mean, it's all right, it depends on what sort of effect you wanna go with, but I'm gonna turn down the factor amount by a lot. So something like that. So I just want there to be just a faint amount of glow coming off it. And then what I'm gonna do, um, I also want there to be that streak effect. So I'm gonna duplicate this glare node. I'm gonna add it after this, uh, this add node here. Actually, I'll connect it to the render layer there. That car's doing that thing again. Um, and now let's just, just have a look at this glare node. I gotta set this to streaks. And then I'll change the streak number. So then that's just the number of streaks. Like you can go up to 16 and it can look like that. I like to go somewhere around about eight or six or something like that. That's Gemini. I mean, different cameras, I think, have different things, diff different numbers, um, but that's pretty good. You can also set it to high quality. I don't know why. Iterations is a similar sort of thing. Just sort of smooths it out. It just, it takes a little bit longer to composite, which is a little bit annoying. Um, color modification will add like, you know, you get like that sort of like rainbow pattern. You can sort of see it there now. It'll add some of that to it. Um, but yeah, that's that's the basics of it. So now that I've got that, I'll duplicate this add node, place it right after the other add node, and then connect this glare node underneath. And now it should be way too much with this default, yep, factor 0.07, because we duplicated it. So I'll dial this way down. So the streak effect, you want it to just be really subtle, not like screaming in your face like, I got a streak, woo! No, you want it to be, just like very like barely there, like so that the viewer can not really see it, but they can sort of feel it, you know what I mean? Um, so something like that, just a tiny little bit, maybe that's even too much, 0 0.002. Come on, yeah, something like that. 
that is uh, that looks pretty good. Maybe this ad amount. Maybe that one's a little bit too much as well. So maybe turn that one down. So it's not too much. Oh, and in that case, I guess hmm, the streak. Can you still see the streak? Oh yeah, you can. Okay, cool. Um, and there you go. So I mentioned that. Oh, I guess I deleted the uh, color balance node, huh? I don't remember doing that. So we'll add in the color balance node again. And this is where I'm just gonna do a tiny little bit of color grading just for the end there. So I'm just gonna set the midtones and just bring them because at the moment it's just, it's, um, what do you call it? It's a monotonous, mono. It's a mono color scheme basically by having just one color. So it's a little bit too bland. And this yellow effect, it, it really is a little bit too much. In fact, I'd probably maybe also turn up the, the temperature of the black body. So instead of 2,800, maybe I'd use 3,000 if I was going to re-render it, but I'm not going to. Um, but I'm now just, just making a, the midtones a little bit blue. So midtones is like these gray areas. So it's instead of it being so yellow and orange, it's just going to be like, you won't be able to really see it, but you can, again, you can feel just a little bit of a difference in color there. Um, and you could make the highlights, you know, a little bit warmer if you wanted to. I don't think you would want to. I think you probably actually want to pull it back the other way, make it a little bit bluer. Eh, maybe, maybe not. Um, you can see, you can play around with it. Um, and you could also maybe make the, the dark tones here, give it a little bit of a blue kick as well. I think it might be a little bit too much. Oh no, just looks weird. Hmm. Hmm. What you got? Yeah, it looks weird. Okay. Um, but anyways, there you go. Now, if you compare this to my final render, you might think, gee, Andrew, that's a bit of a stark difference. What did you do differently that you didn't show us in this video? Well, the biggest difference is that I use a different color management in Blender, which I'm still going to show you in a future tutorial. Like the next tutorial that we do will be on this filmic color management um, because it's too much to explain in this one video um, what what it is actually about it's a uh, it's a really awesome thing um, but basically it, it has allowed me to brighten up the bulb to extreme amounts so that you get more light which is thrown out of the scene without there being that huge blown out hot spot right underneath the light bulb so that's why there's a big difference between our two images here but if you watch my next video, which will come out in hopefully two to three weeks, um, I'm still doing the research to explain the new color management thing. Um, but if you watch that later on, um, you could then just come back to your light bulb scene here and just switch to that thing. Um, and basically, yeah, it allowed me to, to change, I think, um, this filament. I think I used a value of like 50,000 or something as the strength, which, um, yeah, is which, it's like how it gets the light so much further out. Um, but other things you could change, you could, you know, rotate these bulbs in different ways, change the arrangement of them so they don't look, I don't know, conflicting or whatever. Um, it's just, it just requires that next little bit of, uh, of tender loving care to sort of place the elements that, uh, that I didn't really have time, you know, whilst talking, I guess. Um, but there you go. Thank you for watching this video. If you liked it, please give it a like. I appreciate it. Um, otherwise, go ahead and click subscribe if you want to see more tutorials like this one. And if you want, <clears throat> oh, nice finishing note. If you wanted to get that keyboard shortcut PDF, which you can print out and stick to your wall so that you don't have to keep jotting down all the, uh, you know, all the, the handy shortcuts, just click the link underneath this YouTube video and that'll take you there. So that's it from me. Thank you for watching and I will see you next time. Bye.